welcome to the Week in Focus with Sid Cordell and myself. And uh, I know it's boring, Sid, we keep saying the same thing, but by goodness me, this week has been something exceptional. We're not going to yes. squeeze this into our usual um, three quarters of an hour, but uh, we'll do our best. I'll okay. tell you what, we, we'll start off by our friend that's got a very much watched television programme. He's um, gone all Nigel Farage, hasn't he, with GB News. Mm -hmm. He's got an hour there on a Friday evening. And uh, Lee Anderson is his name, previous yes. Labour MP, uh, and now a right-wing Tory. I think that's a fair description of him. But he's in bother. Um, can I say this is a bit of a joke at the start of things because he's in bother for saying uh, something nasty against uh, Sadiq Khan. Most people would rejoice in that. Uh, but uh, here he is saying, um, you know, he's got a lot of um, influence from the Islamists. Now, yeah. first thing I've got to say to you, Sid, is that we're pathetic in GB. You mm. say something 10 times worse than that over the pond in America, and they've got thicker skins than we, and nothing happens. And now the whip's been removed. He's seen as a race. He's seen as all sorts of things. Uh, now, there's a lot of technicals here that you're going to go into. And this is very basic, but politics is pathetic here compared with America, Sid. OK, yes. Now, you see, what's interesting about this is that um, what Lee Anderson was asked to question is that has the UK been taken over by Islamists? And he said, no, I don't think it has. But he said, I think London has and Sadiq Khan has. Um, so he was asked the question and he basically answered the question. Now, Sadiq Khan has said, oh, this is disgusting. You're being racist. But if you actually look at the record of what Sadiq Khan has actually done, it shows that he is very clearly an Islamist himself. So he wrote to The Guardian in the wake of the 7-7 terrorist bombings in London, blaming terrorism on British government policy. He defended some terrible people when he was a barrister before he became London mayor. He defended Zacharias Moussaoui. He was a 9-11 terrorist who confessed to being a member of Al-Qaeda in court. I mean, I'm not saying when he defended him. It's, it's quite interesting. Why was he chosen to defend these people in court? Why was he chosen as a barrister to defend them? Well, obviously, he's sympathetic to them. That's why. He's got a chapter in his book called Actions Against the Police, advising on how to bring charges against the police for racism. Now, you know, the, the police have got um, an anti-Islamic advisor on the, uh, at the suggestion of Sadiq Khan, who is, by the way, as Laird of London, the police commissioner. Um, so basically, the, the, the police, the Met Police in London, are basically doing what Sadiq Khan is asking them to do. And what he's asking them to do is basically not to oppose any Islamist statements. I mean, you know, which are absolutely terrible. I mean, he defended an Islamist extremist, Azam Tamimi, when Dr. Tamimi told a crowd that the publication of the cartoons of Muhammad will cause the world to, to tremble and predicted fires throughout the world if they don't stop. Now, come on, think about that for a moment. I mean, that is serious violence, isn't it? You know, the world is going to tremble if you don't stop these cartoons. There's going to be fires throughout the world. The world is going to be set on fire. Mr. Khan s shared a platform with him, and he said, oh, you know, those threats are just flowery language. <laughs> it's like, what? You know, you know he, he shared a platform with Suleiman Mangani, a South London imam, who urged female su subservience to men and called for the founding of an Islamic State. I mean, he was the lawyer for the Nation of Islam in its successful High Court bid to overturn the 15-year ban on its leader, Louis Farrakhan. So we can go on and on and on what he's done. And he's got clear links to the adv adv advocacy group CAGE, which described the Islamic State executioner, Mohammed Mwazi, as a beautiful young man. I mean, so you've got all this evidence. And this evidence, by the way, I've actually sent to... Um, the chief whip, Simon Clark, who suspended Lee Anderson, and I've also sent it to Lee Anderson himself, and I've also sent it to GB News. I mean, they need to know the facts, and they need to speak out the facts. You know, it's because, you know, and they need to look at the evidence. And by the way, what actually happened this last week, when um, 
it was actually projected onto the House of Commons. Uh, the uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That is calling for the elimination of the Jews and the elimination of the Israeli state. That's what that's what it stands for. That statement. And the police did nothing. The police said, oh, it's perfectly acceptable. There's no crime being committed. Very interesting. Very interesting. You see, what is very clear is that the police in London and the, under Sadiq Khan are allowing Islamism, that's what we can call it, Islamism, to flourish. That's what's going on. And it's there's a lot of truth, I'm afraid, in what uh, Lee Anderson was saying. And uh, as I say, what we should now do it's be looking at the evidence and looking at the facts, not just saying, oh, he's racist and he's, you know, how dare he say anything against Sadiq Khan. And by the way, this is exactly the same policy that Sadiq Khan pursued against Zach Goldsmith when he stood against him for London mayor the first time. Zach Goldsmith was saying some of these things that I've just been saying to you. And Sadiq Khan was saying, you're racist, you're Islamic phobic, how dare you? And the media picked it all up. And said, oh, Sadiq Khan, so Zach Goldsmith is being racist, he's being Islamophobic, how dare he? This will count very strongly against him. He's going to lose the vote for the way he's treated the, the, the lovely man, Sadiq Khan. You know, it's just disgusting, utterly disgusting. We need to get to a point where we face the truth. Well, Sid, you said that, and you've mentioned the media, broadsheets as well as tabloid. Now, why aren't they going for this one? Are they all involved? Well, I think they're they're frightened of being accused of being racist themselves, I think, frankly. And they're probably frightened of press complaints commission and such like. Um, so, but, 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 you know, what they should be doing is examining the evidence. That's what they should be doing. Right. Um, timid Britain. Uh, it's not working out. Um, America, uh, and Trump in particular, has been called out there. My goodness me, if he'd have said this in Britain. Um, I, unless you pay your 2% subs, uh, NATO countries, I'm not going to defend you when I get back in. The other thing that is worrying people, he seems to be, um, well, it is alleged uh, that when, if he gets back in, uh, there'll be a curtailment on the monies, and it's billions of pounds um, by uh, about 90-odd percent, I think, is going, compared with other nations, to the Ukraine. Now, the UK Ukraine are getting very jittery about this. You can understand it. Will he cut back? Will he cut back when he gets in? Well... Um, what Trump has said is that if I'm elected, even before I take office, so I mean, the way it works in America is the elections on the 4th of November, he takes office on the 21st of January. So he has this period from 4th of November to 21st of January when you're president elect. And what they've been doing recently is having the office of the president elect, because obviously it's important that this person is going to be president very soon. They've been elected. And he said, if I'm elected president, even before I take office, so in this period between the 4th of November and 21st of January, I will have sorted out the Ukraine conflict and no more, there'll be no more deaths. The problem will be solved. That's what he said. Now, how he's going to do it, we'll have to wait and see, because I don't know exactly. But what I do know is that he's likely to be making some very severe threats to Russia if they don't pull out their troops, what's going to happen to them? And they'll probably be making some severe threats to Ukraine as well, that if they don't stop fighting and lay down their arms and accept his terms for a peace agreement, then all funding to Ukraine will stop. I think that's what's likely to happen. And by the way, if people don't realise the seriousness of this, I mean, so far, the United States has given to Ukraine 75 billion in military aid. They reckon the war has cost Russia 219 billion. And the contribution by the United States is way above the contributions that any other country has given. I believe you, UK is actually some second, and we've given something like five billion. But you know, it's these these are in, it's enormous sums of money. And what Biden has now said is that he wants to give them another sixty billion. And this is what at the moment is stuck in Congress because he's not only giving Ukraine sixty billion. The whole deal that he wants to push through is ninety five billion. And five billion of it is going to go straight to Hamas. 
I mean, you know, so obviously the um, the uh, Republican members of Congress are saying, no, we're not agreeing to this 95B. Indeed. Um, can I say that there's been a big conference in America? The Farage man has been over there and the trust lady has been over there. Steepak and uh, the Donalds has been giving his speech. Uh, both he and uh, Nigel like to strut around the uh, stage. They get their exercise that way. Uh, and uh, Liz Truss has been converted. Um, and uh, she's been listening to the Donald about deep state. And she's clearly stated now uh, that's what happened to get rid of her. Did you buy that one? Was it deep state Britain? Well, it's very interesting what she said, because what she actually said was that Britain is now being run by quangos. Well, as, as people who, who listen to this uh, broadcast regularly will know that quangos is something that we're extremely concerned about because they've actually cost the country 90 billion per year in 2010. And that figure has now gone up to 224 billion. And these quangos, if people don't know what they are, they're things like the Teachers Regulation Authority, the National Standards Authority. We've actually got, there's actually 12 teaching quangos. Then you've got numerous health quangos. You've got Wilton House, which is a foreign office quango. And all these quangos, which are costing the nation 224 billion a year, are funded by the state, but not controlled by the state. So she was saying we've got to cut these quangos and bring them under control. Now, absolutely, she's totally right. But when she was prime minister, why didn't she say that? You see, the thing is, when she was prime minister, she announced this budget, which was we're going to cut taxes left, right and centre, which was fine. But she didn't say how she was going to pay for it. If she'd have actually said, right, we're going to cut quangos. I mean, all you've got to say is that quangos are costing the country 224 billion a year to fund. We're reducing the funding by 100 billion. That's what she, and you've got to say to the quangos, go through them all, and either say, we don't need you, we're going to stop funding, or you can say to them, we're going to reduce your funding. Because, you know, so the, fun, the total cost of quango to the nation is going to go down from 224 to 124 billion, which is not that much in you know for different from what we were paying in 2010 given inflation and you know it's, it's it's easy it's straightforward i mean you know okay it might make some redundancies but you spend the money on tax cuts and you also spend it on on capital spending you know on, on what we said we'd have a new airport in the thames estuary for london which will bring an enormous amount of wealth plus the transport links that have to be built up to it you know enormous amount of wealth that can be brought into the country to replace the money that's being spent on these on these quangos. Fantastic idea. But, you know, what she said in the CPAC conference in America is absolutely spot on, absolutely spot on. But when she was prime minister, why didn't she do it? I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, we've mentioned Nigel Farage, or I did, and uh, we've mentioned uh, Lee Anderson. And uh, Nigel is trying to get him back into reform. Uh, I say back into reform. He um, used to be Labour MP, of course. Uh, and as we've said, it's gone to the right of the Tories. But he's ideal, one would have thought. Uh, and his local support could even get over the problem uh, first past the post. And uh, at least um, reform might get one seat. It's all very clever. Perhaps uh, Liz Trust can be approached by Nigel now. Um, no, I don't think Liz Truss is going to go in that direction because I think there's a, a number of Conservative MPs that at least support her philosophy if they don't support her herself. And I don't think all those there's any reason for all those MPs to jump ship. I think they're more interested in trying to argue their case from within the Conservative Party, which I certainly think Liz Truss is. And by the way, there is a very strong division now within the Conservative Party because on the other side, you've got Penny Mordaunt, who is clearly totally woke uh, and she has the support of probably a hundred conservative MPs there's over 300 in the house of commons you know this this i think um you know that oh god what's his name sorry one two three four five i think frankly jacob reese mogg is a better 
a flag bearer for the right of the Conservative Party than Liz Truss. But the right of the Conservative Party is there. They're very strong and they will be campaigning within the Conservative Party. Um, but as far as reform are concerned, you see, I, I've got some concerns about reforms policies because reformers saying they're going to cut tax drastically. They're talking about raising the tax threshold to 20,000 and they're not going to say how they're going to pay for it. Well, what they have said is they're going to cut every department by 5%. So they're going to take 5% off the National Health Service. They're going to take 5% off defence. I mean, that's frankly, that's irresponsible as well. That's utterly irresponsible. I don't think reform have got sensible policies for the nation, frankly. I mean, our policies in the Christian People's Alliance are way better. I mean, our manifesto, if it was actually got proper national publicity, people would realise that our policies totally make sense and could be put into practice tomorrow. I don't think reforms could be, frankly. Well, you're surprising me, Sid, because I've got a list of stuff here and I was going to mention it. Uh, later in our chat, but you've raised it now, so we'll go into it. I thought this was, you could have written their manifesto, which is not officially out, but we all know what it's going to say. Uh, you've got to um, reach the wage of 70,000 before you get 40% tax, as, as mentioned. Um, the stealth tax threshold, whereby uh, where you start paying tax is going to be increased to 20,000. I think everybody in the nation wants that. Um, and, of course, there would be, strangely, um, marked reductions in stamp duty. I approve of that, absolutely. And, actually, I approve of the inheritance tax that reform are saying they're going to get rid of. And so, strangely enough, this morning does the aforementioned list trust. She has got a advisor that's actually said there'll be 300 thousand jobs created if you get rid of inheritance tax uh, that's all to deal with you know people staying here that would you know not jump ship uh inheritance tax is very complicated it's a jealousy tax of course that labor want to get rid of uh, but it's not as simple as that and it's going to cost the government buttons i don't think that will happen in the budget they might get some courage the tories and say well uh, we'll cut it 50% of what you're paying now, but I don't think they'll abolish it. Hope I'm wrong, but there you are. So uh, the other thing that they say, they're going to encourage, and I think you would approve of this, um, education uh, and health reform. And the first thing they're going to say is that we want to encourage private schools. Uh, we are to encourage a private part of the NHS so we'll give 20% tax relief. If you pay insurance, uh, private insurance for your health insurance, that's an excellent idea. Leave more beds for everybody else and leave more school places for everybody else. Do you go along with that latter thing? Well, those things aren't in our manifesto, but they're certainly something which can be considered. I think our primary aim is to make the National Health Service work. And our policy on that is to bring back GP fund holding, which worked very, very well in the 1990s. And we believe that that would solve a lot of the problems of the NHS. Um, we're not totally opposed to what's being suggested, but it's not in our manifesto. And the key issue, as I say, is how is it going to be paid for? I mean, you see, it's OK saying, oh, we, we're going to introduce all this tax relief. We're going to cut all this tax. But. Uh, if you're paying for it by um, cutting 5% spending from every government department, then I'm, I'm afraid, no, we do not agree with that. And that is a very, very bad policy, frankly. See, our policy, which is correct, is to cut quangos, which we talked about earlier, save 100 billion. And also, see, one of the other things which was introduced, believe it or not, by the Liberal Democrats when they were part of the coalition, was that all government contracts have got to have a social requirement. In other words, you know, every you've, you've got to look at your racist policies and you've got to look at your, your LGBT policies as part of a government contract. We get rid of all of that and we make the only requirement for government contracts value for money. 
And we believe on that basis, all government contracts are costing 379 billion. That's how much they're being spent. We reckon we could save 10%. And by the way, the Adam Smith Institute has also done a research on this to reckon that we could save roughly 10% if we just make the only test uh, value for money. And we would use that money to cut tax. And by the way, you know, it actually only costs five billion to take one P off income tax. So, you know, if you use that money to cut tax, you could take five P off, off income tax and it could go a long way. But the, the policies that the reform party are putting forward, I'm sorry to cut five percent off every government department to do these things are wrong. Sorry, they are wrong. What about the um, net zero thing? That will be cheered to the rafters. Uh, would uh, CPA cheer it? I, it's not a rowing back on net zero. It's practically an abolition that they're going to put forward. It's a nonsense, net zero. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, you see, one of the things that we believe, you know, when it talks about the climate, is that God created heaven and earth. And... Um, it's, it actually says one of the sounds of heaven is worthy art thou our Lord God, for you've created all things by your will. They were created and have their being. So it actually says the angels in heaven say the world exists according to God's will. Now, if that's correct, then all this stuff about, you know, man-made climate change is just false, I'm afraid. And of course, you've also got what it says in 2 Chronicles 7.14. You know, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked way, I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Heal their land. And, you know, as I think we've talked about before, we've actually seen this incredibly in Fiji. I mean, I won't go into details now, but, I mean, all the evidence is that as the people of Fiji repented, God healed the islands. The coral reefs came back to life. Incredible vegetation was produced and, you know, the whole climate was changed. I mean, it's very, very interesting. So we're on the wrong lines when we're saying it's all man-made climate change and we've got to reduce carbon footprint and so on and so forth. We've got no problem with re reducing pollution. Reducing pollution is a good thing. But to think that somehow man can therefore control the climate is just frankly wrong, completely wrong. We've got various quotes coming from different uh, sides of the political spectrum, Sid. And they all say the same. What has happened in Parliament this week is a complete disgrace. Well, uh, yes, I think most people would say it is. Shenanigans is going on there. And we are really akin to the US in this. They're past masters. But um, we uh, realise... And so does the speaker. He has boobed big time, regrets it. Who are his advisers? Yes. So just to explain to people very quickly what's happened is that in the House of Commons, they have opposition parties have a right to put, uh, to have time to put their resolutions. And the main opposition, the Labour Party, have their time but also some time is allocated to the more minor opposition parties, the biggest minor opposition party being the Scottish National Party. So the Scottish National Party were given time in Parliament to put forward their resolution. They decided that they wanted to put forward a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza by Israel, irrespective of whether any hostages were released or not, and, and irrespective of the response of Hamas. So Hamas could carry on fighting, but Israel had to stop fighting, uh, as, as far as the SNP were concerned. Now, that resolution was not supported by the, 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 the Labour leadership, who said, no, there's got to be some you know, responsibility for Hamas and there must be some humanitarian considerations put into it and so on and so forth. We've got to consider about the civilians and helping them and supporting them as part of the whole motion, not just tell Israel you have to stop fighting and that's the end of the story. So the Labour leadership was not happy to support that resolution, but it was estimated that there were 100 Labour MPs that they were going to break with the Labour leadership and support it which was going to be cause incredible embarrassment to the Labour Party. Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, went to see the, um, 
the Speaker of the House of Commons and spent half an hour with him. And we don't know what he said, but the outcome was that the Speaker came to the House of Commons and said, I'm going to allow Labour to amend the SNP resolution. Now, that's something which never happens. They have opposition time. They put forward their resolution and it's voted on. That's what happens. Because for the first time, the Labour Party were allowed to amend the SNP resolution, it meant they put down what they wanted. All the Labour people voted for what they wanted and there was no vote on the SNP resolution. That's what happened. Now, of course, the SNP were furious. And the Conservatives were also furious because, obviously, the Labour Party had got out of the embarrassment that was going to happen if the SNP vote had been put to the floor. So, of course, the Conservatives said, this isn't fair, this isn't right. You're not doing things according to the, stand, the standing orders of the House. Now, it's quite interesting. The Speaker, when he first announced this change, said, oh, all these rules are outdated. It was all goes back to a time when there were only two parties in the House of Commons. We've got lots more than two parties now. So we've got to change our standing orders and allow opposition parties to amend the motion to other opposition parties. That's what he said. And it's like when he said it, it's like, whoa, what's going on? Um, but anyway... That's what he said. After it was all said, he said, oh, I did it because of threats made to Labour MPs. Well, he never said that in advance, but he said that afterwards. Now, I think one thing which we should say is that undoubtedly there have been a lot of threats made to Labour MPs if they didn't support the SNP motion by the Islamists that we were talking about earlier. They've been very, very vocal and very active in making threats. No question. But... If threats are being made, that shouldn't be the Speaker altering the standing orders in response to the threats. That should be the police. So where are the police? The police should be investigating all these threats and arresting people and protecting members of Parliament. That's what should be happening. The Metropolitan Police are doing nothing. They're totally useless. And what their role is disgusting. The role of Keir Starmer is highly questionable. I mean, he said, oh, I didn't threaten the Speaker. Well, I'm sure he didn't threaten the Speaker directly, but he probably said to him, we're going to have a general election very soon. We're likely to be the largest party. And we'll have to make a decision as to who the Speaker is in the next Parliament. So, you know, your position is, is obviously under consideration. He probably said something like that, which, can't, which, you know, wasn't a threat to the Speaker as such, but it was an implied threat. That's probably almost certainly what happened. Uh, I can't see anything else except uh, if Keir Starver had got one of his henchmen to go in there and lay the thing on the carpet uh, so he could say, well, it wasn't me, Gov. Uh, no, but, but either no, way, but, I can't believe that something like that was not said. No, but we, we, we do know that Keir Starver spent 30 minutes with the Speaker. We do know that. Yep, so yep. he didn't send somebody else. We do know he himself went in and spoke to the Speaker. What he said was obviously, we don't know. But we, we do know the result of what he said. <laughs> yes, really. Mm. Well, I tell you what, from the sublime to the sublime, we're going to go to New York, and the New York mayor is in uh, a bit of a pickle. Uh, one of the refuge cities, of course, uh, in um, uh, what I should use the right term, sanctuary cities, where if you're an illegal immigrant, you, you can go in there and uh, spend your time and be fed and watered, etc. Um, and um, the mayor is getting fed up of all the illegal immigrants. He's actually said, um, look, um, if you keep attacking our police, we're going to have to take severe remedies. Um, and the remedy he's got is to, put, to downgrade them. They will no longer stay in five-star hotels. They're only going to be put up in four-star hotels. My goodness me. And then he finished off this tirade against these poor immigrant people. And I'll quote what he said. Um, we are sending a, a strong message out there. Uh, we really mean business. Well, I wish I could get business like four-star hotels given to me, Sid, as an illegal person. I mean, this is the ultimate, and it's in Britain in just the same way. Uh, our immigration policies are hopeless. 
and um, at least we've not gone as far as the states. Some of the states have got policies like this, uh, and uh, their capitals of each state have been burned down in some cases, or almost so. Uh, this is extreme liberalism, socialism. Yes. Now, uh, obviously, we've covered quite a lot of ground there, but I think I think the first thing we need to say is that, for me, the biggest issue is the speed in which decisions are being taken and the level to which people are allowed to go through a legal process of appeals. And it's not just one appeal, it's two, three, four appeals. So, um, but it's it's been possible for some countries to literally make decisions and turn people around within 12 hours. And frankly, for some cases, I'm not saying for all cases, because obviously if people are coming from Ukraine or, or from Gaza or from a genuine war-torn situation and have got to the UK. I mean, there is an issue there, by the way, because asylum should be applied for in the first safe country you come to. So the first safe country from Ukraine or Gaza isn't the UK. But I guess it's theoretically possible for people to get an aircraft out of these countries and say, well, the only aircraft... Uh, the only place the aircraft was going to was the UK, so it was the only choice we had. I mean, I guess that's theoretically possible, so we can't rule it out. But uh, if people are coming from very dangerous war-torn countries, obviously they've, their as asylum application should be given proper consideration. If they're coming from Albania, which is not a war-torn country or a dangerous country, or they're coming from some other country where there's no wars taking place and they're not dangerous, Consideration should be given very quickly to the application and within 12 hours, a decision should be made and the people should either be saying, yeah, we can consider your application further or no, I'm sorry, we can't consider your application further. You must return the same way you've come. Simple. And you see, what's happening at the moment is that asylum seekers are, are actually being allowed to be asylum seekers for a period of two years. And like you say, they've been put up in five-star hotels or four-star hotels, whatever, or they've been put on a barge, and they're staying there for two years while their application goes through a very long and detailed process. Well, frankly, it's nonsense. It's utter nonsense. It's got to change. The whole process has got to change. It's got to be much more efficient, simplified, maybe one appeal. It should be allowed to the courts, but no more than one appeal should be allowed in the courts. Let uh, me give you some good news, Sid. We have a, a knight in shining armour, uh, literally breaking news this very day. The Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk, what a fine gentleman he is. He's been put in charge of the prisons. Now, yes. um, the prison capacity is 89,000. Mm. We're on 88,000. We've been that for a long time. We're in a screaming at the limits there. And he's been told to sort it out. And he's making some very big progress. Um, the first thing he's tackling is the fact that there are 10,500 foreign prisoners, immigration prisoners, out of that 88,000. And he wants to send them straight back, whether they be shoplifters, or drug dealers, you're back to where you came from. You've just mentioned Albania. He's already reached an agreement with Albania that they take back their dirty washing. And 13% uh, of the baddies in our jails are Albanians, followed by Poland, followed by Romania. Deals have got to be done, but it's offski time. The other thing that you've mentioned there is this wretched human rights laws. Well, the laws to get rid of these people are already there, like so many things in Great Britain. The laws already exist. We don't need or want new laws. And yep. he can get rid, he reckons, of these offenders straight away. First thing, uh, you cannot bring up new appeals. Uh, you've got to go on your original appeal. So in other words, instead of years getting rid of them, it will be weeks getting rid of them. As you have just said, they can be got rid of in early course. That will immediately free up our jails. He wants to build at least 
four mega jails in addition that will each house 10,000 prisoners. Now we see these in Spain. They go up very quickly and they work. Why don't they go up quickly? Yes, you guessed it in GB. The reason, of course, is planning permission. So he's out to get the planners and get a shortcut through whereby it's not going to take centuries to get anything built. Uh, it's not just uh, HS2 that has suffered this way. So planning needs to be sorted out desperately. So well done him. Let's hope he gets away with it. Yeah, I mean, I think there should be a very clear rule that if anyone commits a serious crime in this country, they should be immediately um, sent back if they are asylum seekers or uh, illegal immigrants. Um, there should be there should be no question. I mean, obviously, if someone's you know caught speeding or something, you don't say, "Oh, well, you've been caught speeding, so we're going to send you back." I mean, but if there's any sort of serious crime that warrants prison, then um, th th there should be no question. I mean, it should be they should be immediately sent back. Um, you know, we've we've we have absolutely we've got to be tough. I think, by the way, there should be some exceptions, although I can totally understand that the rule should be that your first uh, asylum application is the only one you can make. You can't alter it. I understand that could be the rule, but there should be exceptions because I've been personally involved in situations where uh, Muslims have become Christians um, from Pakistan and they're totally genuine conversions. And because they are genuine conversions, if they were sent back to Pakistan, they would be in serious danger for their lives. Um, but, you know, there are enormous number of Muslims that claim they've converted to Christianity where it's not real. And the way you test this, by the way, is to say to these people, OK, the Quran says, for instance, in Surah 839, fight against them until there's no more ascension and all say there's no God but Allah. That's what the Quran says. Uh, do you condemn what the Quran says or do you think that you should be fighting against anyone that, do that doesn't believe in Allah? And, you know, no Muslim will condemn what the Quran says. Most of them will avoid answering the question. Most say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I've never read the Quran or something like this. You know, <laughs> you know, it's uh, that they'll, 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 I don't, I don't know, I don't understand what you're asking me. They'll, they'll, they'll try desperately to avoid answering the question. But if you say the question must be answered, I must know. Do you condemn what the Quran says, yes or no? If they say no, then it's like, I'm sorry, there's no conversion. You're clearly not. You're clearly still a Muslim. You you um, cannot stay in this country, full stop. Your asylum application is fraudulent. Right, I've got some more good news for you. Um, and again, it's on page nine of every paper. Um, at the beginning, it was on every page for weeks. We are suffering under Putin's rationing of gas and petrol and coal and everything. But now we're free. We've done enough deals with Canada and America to make us completely independent of Russia. That should be on page one, uh, but it ain't. And shame on you, press. Let's have some more good news. But it is good news. Um, the bad part of the good news is that what Russia have done is done deals, of course, and sell their products to India and China. They're refining them and they're sending them in the back door to, to Britain. Oh, the hypocrisy of it. Uh, but at least we now can get truly free of Putin. The war, as you mentioned, is costing him a fortune. Um, I hope we are in this for the medium term. I hope Trump does come up with the answers, um, but now is not the time to flee. No, um, but one of the key things also is that, you know, we need to revive drilling in the North Sea, which uh, I know Liz Truss said she was going to. I don't really know what's happened under Rishi Sunak, but, um, you know, we've got our own oil and gas, which we can get access to. And the only reason they stopped it was because of woke carbon zero, you know, net zero, which we we're talking about earlier. I'm sorry, we're going to need gas and oil for a long time to come. 
and the idea that we we should just stop all drilling in the North Sea and import all our gas and oil. I mean, it's it's utter nonsense. And by the way, since you also mentioned America, you know, it's Donald Trump has said he's going to come in. The first thing he's going to do is drill, baby, drill. You know, we're going to get as much oil out as we possibly can. And we're going to increase our production. We're going to sell our oil around the world and we're going to use it as as, as, as a weapon if we need to use it as a weapon to um, to support countries that support us and to punish countries that don't support us. I mean, you know, he, he's got the right approach. I'm sorry. This sort of like, oh, gas and oil is 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 somehow evil. You know, it's just utter nonsense. Right. We're going to uh, go in the deep end here, Sid. And nothing that you'll ever hear on British television. They're too frightened. Ofcom would have them. Um, it's the proverbial elephant in the room. And it's as follows. We have had more over the last few years since uh, mass immigration. And it is mass immigration. Of terrible tragedies. It may be an acid or alkaline attack. It may be the bizarre and horrible incident, incidents that's been announced this last weekend of the knifing by a mother of three children. Those are two examples. There are many, many more. The vast amount of these terrible tragedies have been caused by immigrants. Now, that's a fact. But nobody dare say that in the United Kingdom because they're frightened. These people have not got our culture. It's the culture of Af Afghanistan to get acid and alkaline attacks going against your so-called loved ones. There's all sorts of things going on there that are uh, acceptable. I put that in inverted commas in other countries, but they're certainly not part of it. And this is the lack of integration. Um, these people are causing havoc in our country and we're letting them in just to get our short term GDP figures up uh, or our universities funded by three times the amount that a British British person would have to pay by attending our university. This is shocking, Sid, and nobody dare say it. Will the Christian People's Alliance dare say it? Um, no, I, th I think it's very dangerous when you start blaming uh, immigrants for, for crime. Um, you know, we've had in this country Reggie and Cray and, you know, the, the, the Cray twins with organised crime. There's a lot of organised crime in this country now from people that got nothing to do with immigration. There's a lot of drug related crime that's going on. I mean, I've seen I've seen criminals active myself through um, my working life as a financial advisor. Um, I've actually had people say to me, you know, what we need to do is to organise a, a really good insurance scam where we can both make a lot of money. And it's like I just run a mile, obviously, because I'm an honest person. But, you know, it's out there. There's a lot of criminals out there. And um, it is, it is wrong to uh, to um, label immigrants as criminals. What we the right approach is to anybody that comes in this country has to know that if you're convicted of any serious crime, you are not allowed to remain in the country. That is the right approach. And uh, and I think we should leave it there. And but by the way, um, while we're talking about this, um, one thing which I became aware of in this last week, which I didn't really fully understand before, is the fact that Joe Biden, before he became president, made it absolutely clear that he was celebrating the fact that in America, that um, white people of European stock are now less than 50%. And the numbers of those who are not of white European stock will be growing and growing. And the more they grow, the better. And we need to be welcoming anybody that wants to come into this country, into this country. It's what he said before he became president. 
And since he's become president, he's had a complete open doors policy. I mean, you think we've got a problem in this country. In America, they've had more than five million coming in per year. I mean, and the federal government has been fighting uh, state uh, governments like Texas and Arizona that are trying to stop the number of, of um, people crossing the border. The state, the federal government is saying, let them come, let them come, let them come. And it's also, Biden's also had a policy of anyone that's come into this country, doesn't matter how they're here, they should have the right to vote and they should have full right to work and so on and so forth. Doesn't matter how they've got here, just process them, give them the right to vote. Why? Because he expects they're all going to vote for him. I mean, so it's utterly corrupt what he's doing. Right, uh, a skillful answer there, a political answer. Um, well done, Sid. Uh, it still remains the truth that these bizarre killings are by people not of our culture. Uh, and um, quite rightly, uh, we've got to defend um, the many, many immigrants that have contributed to this country. Uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, but the bathwater certainly wants throwing out. Uh, and let's get a grip, UK. Lastly, Sid, time has gone. Um, well, I've been naughty in the past, sometimes tongue-in-cheek with you, uh, hinting that you shouldn't be called the Christian People's Alliance. You should be called the People's Alliance. I mean, I think that's a better title than reform, to be honest. Because the Christian thing, disgracefully perhaps, is seen as a negative. And I even said at one occasion that you'd probably get more votes by dropping the Christian. Um, but the more we go down the path, uh, the more I see the wisdom of sticking to guns. In that, we are body, mind and spirit. And when you listen to politicians... They've not got the answer. Most of the average Joe will say the same. They come out with good schemes. They're com completely committed to their party. Some people think they should be completely committed. I mean, it's that much of a, I use the term correctly or incorrectly, evangelical position, not seeing any other pe person's uh, position. I mean that in the non-spiritual sense, of course. They couldn't be changed from their party line, whatever you said to them. So politics is maybe not the full answer. And we've said body, mind, uh, education, I mean, that'll cure it all. So politics and education, we'll get to the bottom of it. And it's not worked. But the third thing is spirit. Now, that's why you've got Christian in your title. And therefore, I do approve. <laughs> but um, the public don't see it that way at the moment, do they? Well, you know, it's. I think it's very important that people know what we stand for. And we stand 100% for the teaching of Jesus and the moral values of Jesus. And uh, if people don't know, we also believe very much in what Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So, you know, we believe in the prophetic. We actually have a whole group called CPA Prophetic, where we actually listen to God and hear what he, he has to say. And if you can hear God's voice, you can hear, you can ask him what his will is in any and every situation. And we don't go around saying God has told me this and God has told me that. And we have to do everything with humility. I mean, it says, test the spirits, you know, do not dis despise prophesying, do not quench the spirit but um, abstain from every form of evil. You know, so, you know, we have to test spirits. We have to test prophecies. We don't just accept everything, but we seek the will of God and we seek to only say things that are, that, that are according to the will of God in our manifesto. And we don't say, you know, we, we, we're writing this because God has told us, but we just, we just put the, the policies forward. And I think that the vast majority of people that read our manifesto will say there's incredible wisdom in the manifesto and the wisdom comes from God. I mean, it, you know, it's it, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So one of the key gifts, I should say, sorry, of the Holy Spirit is the gift of wisdom. It's the first gift. 
in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of wisdom. And we use that gift and we need to use that gift. Christians need to use that gift all the time, frankly. And we need to hear from God all the time. And if we hear from God and honour God and put God first in our nation, our nation will prosper. Christians need to get behind the Christian People's Alliance, first and foremost. And then other people who aren't Christians need to see the wisdom of what's being proposed and what's being put forward. And if we have proper publicity and we have proper media coverage, I believe, and Christians properly got behind our party, we could, we could, we could take power, frankly. You know, we could easily. We're ready to take power. We've got the people in place to do it. You've got also the press and Joe Public, many of them would say the following, and I want your answer to this. If you're hearing God's voice, you've got a problem. Well, that's only for people that don't believe in God. <laughs> I mean, if you don't believe in God, then obviously, you know, you think oh, God doesn't exist. If you're hearing voices, then, you know, he's, he's just voices in your head. If you do believe in God and you know God does exist, uh, then you know that he speaks. You see, the key thing is relationship. And, you know, Jesus said, uh, you know, I don't call you servants. I mean, I call you friends for everything I've received from my father I've made known to you. I mean, you know, it's like we are friends of God and God speaks to us. Yes, he does speak to us. And But it's understandable if you believe in God and you know that he wants a relationship with, with everybody, wants a relationship with you then, you know, it's understandable that he wants to talk to you about the things that are on his heart. And if you don't believe that what's going on in Gaza is on God's heart, and you don't believe that what's going on in Ukraine is on God's heart, and if you don't believe in, in that violence all over the world is a part of God's heart, then you don't know God. But we do know God, and we do know what's on his heart. To clarify it, Sid, uh, perhaps I should have phrased it that way at the beginning. Are you hearing audible voices of God? No, it's, um, uh, I mean, the way most, I mean, we, we do see pictures sometimes, and sometimes you can receive pictures, but it's mostly more like a thought that comes into your mind um, that you like, you know, you hear very much that these thoughts come into your head and you think, wow, where's that come from? And you recognise as you're more experienced that it's come from God. And uh, but as I say, all these things have to be tested. I mean, if you want to, if you, if you want me to give you an example, just in this last week, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, I heard God saying to me, uh, Matthew five, five and six. And OK, that was an audible voice. But I heard this thought came into my mind in Matthew five, five and six in the middle of the night. And it's like I had to get up and see what it said. And I got up in the middle of the night and and I read it and it was. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And I believe God was saying direct to the Christian People's Alliance, because we are humble in what we say, and we provided we maintain a humble approach, we will inherit the earth. And provided we continue to hunger and thirst after righteousness, God says we will be satisfied, and he will open doors for us. Come on, that's, that's an example of God speaking to us. Right, we've uh, completely overrun, never mind, run out of time. <laughs> and um, thank you. And uh, you can go down and lie down for a rest now, Sid. We've put you through it this morning. Thank you, Sid. We'll see you next week.